Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, how thankful we are tonight for the privilege of gathering together where we are here in this place. And we pray your blessing upon our time together. We pray that you would encourage and strengthen our hearts to the living of these days, that we might be truly thankful for the gifts you've given us and be strengthened for the task of following after Christ. We pray your blessing upon our thinking to get tonight and consideration of your word and its truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your copy of the scripture, I invite you to open your Bible to Paul's first epistle to Timothy. First epistle, uh, St. Paul to Timothy. The final chapter, chapter 6. <clears throat> Tonight I want to talk to you on the subject of the good fight. The good fight. <clears throat> Christians ought to be good fighters. We should be tough. And now not hard-headed. I didn't say hard-headed. And I didn't say hard to get along with. I said tough tough-minded, uh, enduring well, persevering well, steadfast in a variety of important ways. And I'll entitle this message, The Good Fight, from verse 12. You'll, I think, readily see where I get this title from this text. 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of, of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. It's not without notice that the previous verse, verse 11, says the following, but as for you, O man of God, he's speaking to young Timothy, a pastor, flee these things. What things? Well, the things he's been uh, talking about in, uh, in verses uh, four and following. And he talks about being puffed up with conceit and understanding nothing. It, it means you don't know anything, but you don't know you don't know anything. You think you know it all when you know nothing. Uh, have a craving for controversy. Isn't that interesting? A craving for controversy. Have you ever known anybody who's loved to have a good argument? They just love to create a controversy. Quarreling about words and envy, dissension, slander, evil, suspicion, creating friction among other people. Depraved in mind, deprived of truth. And then he goes on to all sorts of uh, things including greed, the love of money. Uh, flee these things, verse 11 says, and pursue righteousness, which he defines in verse 11 as godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. And then he says, fight the good fight. Take hold of eternal life. I think he's connecting these ideas. Uh, the way we fight the good fight is to flee those things we ought not to do and pursue those things we ought to do that is fighting the good fight. There are two things I want to point to your attention tonight as we think together about fighting the good fight. And I want to talk to you about being good fighters in the way that we ought to flee that which we ought not to do and pursue that which we ought to do. Two things are, number one, the elements of the good fight or contained in the good fight elements contained in the good fight and second is the action required to fight the good fight let me talk to you first about the elements contained in the good fight i think there are at least four elements in fighting well and every christian is charged this is not just about timothy it is about timothy but it's about you and it's about me as he says to Timothy, fight the good fight. He says to me and to you, fight the good fight. 
What are the elements involved in fighting the good fight? Four things I want to bring up. One, intentionality. Intentionality. If we're going to fight the good fight, fleeing what we ought not to do, pursuing what we ought to do, it's because we have every intention of doing that. You have to make up your mind sooner or later whose you belong to, who you belong to, and whose you are. Your intentionality. But that's not enough. Let me add to that focus of will. Focus of will. I heard a... Uh, a sprinter say one time, his sprinter, you know, he ran these short sprints in competition. And he talked about the focus of the will, that the will is, is consolidated into that one narrow frame towards the finish line. And you put everything in it. If we're going to fight well, we need intentionality, but we also need focus of will. We can't be distracted by a lot of things. This one thing I do, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, he was committed to doing that thing which God would have him to do. A focus of will, intentionality and focus of will. Third, an earnest effort, a diligent effort. A real good fight is a fight that is that involves everything you've got to give it. I don't know whether, and I don't want to hear about your experiences, but have you, you ever been in a fight? Mm hmm. I have, sadly enough. Uh, it, it, what did they say? It's not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. Have you ever heard that? It's not always the biggest fellow that wins, it's, it's the determination and the diligence and the earnestness with which one fights. Earnest effort. Put it all in there. Intentionality, focus of will, earnest effort. And number four, maybe a surprise to some of us, emotional management. Emotional management. And this is really on my heart tonight. Emotional management. I'm speaking about managing your emotions to the degree that your emotions do not dictate to you when you fight. Your emotions can get in your way, particularly if they're negative emotions. If you're giving in to hopelessness and despair and, and struggle and a sense of abandonment, emotional management. We're going to talk about that a little more in just a moment. Elements of the good fight. Second major category here is the action required of the good fight. And I want to suggest to you five things under the action of the good fight. Fighting well is active and it requires that we do a number of things. So I'm, I'm now answering the question, pastor, I want to do what this says, fight the good fight. How do I do that? What, what do I do to fight well? Let me suggest five things from my pastor's heart to you. Number one, if you want to fight well, that is to flee that which you ought not to do, pursue that which you ought to do, you ought to soak your mind in biblical truth. Soak your mind in biblical truth. Now I'm going to put a comma right there and finish the sentence like this. Especially that part of the truth that speaks to your struggle. Period. Soak your mind in biblical truth, especially that truth that strikes your problem. Um, I, I don't think we can do any better than to be mindful of the fact that if we're going to walk with Christ, if we're going to fight against temptation, if we're going to, if you're going to endure trials, if we're going to do all of that, we're going to have to commit ourselves to soaking our minds in the truth. The truth will set you free. The truth will expose the lies that you've been believing. And every one of us believes lies. And we're all vulnerable in one way or another. But the truth will, will shine the light on that, that part of our lives where we really need help. Especially that truth that speaks to that area where we're struggling. So that's why I would 
I would urge you to get in the Bible. Certainly read the Bible. The better you get to know the Bible before you, before the battle starts, the better off you are. If you don't know your Bible and the battle starts, it's too late to go to school. You go to school in peacetime. When war comes, you go to battle. There's no, there's no school. Now you put into practice what you know. So study well when the battle is not occurring. And soak your mind in biblical truth. Number two, what else should I do? After I soak my mind in biblical truth, let me suggest I soak my heart in the promises of God. And think about God's love for me. Soak your heart in the promises of God and think about his love for you. After you've soaked your mind in the Bible, then you soak your heart in God's promises. Do you know God has promises that he gives to every child of God in Jesus Christ? When you came to Christ, you accepted Christ, but Christ accepted you. And he claimed you. He claimed you, and that's why you claim him. And he wants to, you to understand his promises are for you. And you're going to need his promises. Right? I would urge you to make a study of the promises of God. I once read, I don't know if it's true or not, 35,000 promises in the Bible. I don't know if that's true or not. Not all those promises belong to you and me. But a lot of them do. And you can always know, how do you know if a promise in the Old Testament is for you? It'll be quoted or referred to in some way in a gospel context in the New Testament. So, for example, Joshua 1, when Joshua was scared out of his proverbial gourd, Moses is dead. He's now the one to lead Israel, and he does not feel capable of doing that. God says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Don't fear and both be not dismayed. And and what can you think of any part in the New Testament where you get the same promise? Matthew 28, 20. Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm with you. Larry and Sam and Sally and Joy and Rebecca and, and Jimbo and whoever you are. He's with you. I will, Hebrews 13, never leave you nor forsake you. Does that not sound like Joshua 1? Just as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. So he's repeating. So that promise is not just for Joshua. That promise is for every child of God. Right? And then you think of Romans 8, 35 through 39, and this whole long list. Write those out sometime. Get your piece of paper. And list every circumstance that he lists there that could separate you from the love of God, but can't. Life, death, things present, things to come, things high, things low. He goes through a, just a long litany of things. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. What am I saying? Soak your heart in the promise of God. Because your struggle is helped by remembering God's promises. Third, feed your faith the truth about God's revealed will. Feed your faith. I oftentimes feel like that man who said to Jesus when Jesus was about to work a miracle and Jesus asked him, do you believe? And his response was, Lord, I believe, help mine unbelief. Remember that? Don't you feel like that sometimes? Lord, I believe, but I don't believe enough. I want to believe better. Feed your faith the truth that faith is fed by. That feeds the faith in your heart and in your life. Take the truth and feed your faith with it. This is after you soak your mind in the truth. This is an application of that truth into your faith. Sometimes I'll talk to myself. It sounds weird, but it helps. 
John, God said he is going to work things out. And John sometimes says, strange though it may seem, how's he going to do that? And my response to John is, hush. That's God's business. He didn't tell you how he's going to do it, but he said he will do it. Your job is to believe he will do it and wait on him to do it. Feed your faith with the truth that he gives you. Number four, this is, this is part of why I picked this text. Harness fear and negative emotion. Harness it. What am I saying here? I'm saying uh, don't, let it, don't let it get out of control. Does negative emotion and fear get out of control sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, it does. And if we let it run, if we give it air, it will take over. We will be immobilized. We, we won't be able to do anything. We'll just, be, we'll just sit there and do nothing because we're just overwhelmed by the fear that we feel. Harness that. Don't let it get to that point. How do you do that? Well, if you need to, drag it to Jesus and say, Jesus, take care of it. I'm tired of messing with it. Sometimes it's just simply, I refuse to allow that to be in my mind. Have you noticed? I've noticed. I wake up at three in the morning. I can't sleep. Anybody here like that? And have you noticed when you wake up at three in the morning, every problem you've got comes to your mind? And then what happens? You start thinking about it, and then what happens? You can't go back to sleep. Now, for the next few hours, you're just ruminating on all the problems you've got, and it's dark. The room's dark. It's terribly dark, and it looks like nothing is right. Fight those emotions. Fight those fears. By the way, quoting Scripture is a real good thing to do. Jesus quoted Scripture to the devil. I think that's a wonderful example. Yeah, but what about this, Satan? Yeah, but what about this, Satan? What about this? God said this. God said this. God said this. Harness that emotion. And, and let me say this. I understand sometimes emotion is, is, is stronger than we are. But I think it's important that we go to the Lord in prayer and say, give me grace to put this fear in a box. And put the lid on the box. Because once it gets out, I'm in deep, deep trouble. Five. Nurture. We're talking about actions. Soak your mind in the truth. Soak your heart in the promises of God. Feed your faith the truth about his revealed will. Four. Harness fear and negative emotion. Five. Nurture your fellowship with God. And nurture your prayer to God. Nurture your fellowship with God and nurture your, your fellowship with God and your prayer to God. Um, God really does want to have fellowship with us. There's a relationship here. So nurture that. How do you do that? Well, let's talk about prayer. Do you pray? How do you pray? Do you pray? Genuinely, authentically, really. I mean, if I tell God what I think God wants to hear, but I don't tell him what I'm really feeling, I'm lying to God. Can we get real right here? Number one, God knows you're lying. Number two, you shouldn't lie to God. And I think it's much more authentic to say, God, I am ticked. I'm mad. God, I'm scared. God, I'm frustrated. God, I've done everything I know to do. What else can I do? Okay. But, but telling God that helps you. Because you're having this conversation with God. There's a place and an important place for praise and gratitude and all of that. Please treat God with respect. Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven. Let's not treat him like our buddy. Hallowed be thy name. You're holy. But it doesn't mean you're, he's unapproachable. Hebrews says, come boldly to the throne of grace. 
to pour out your needs, to pour out your weaknesses. There's, there's a reality to this thing. God, I don't want to stay where I am. I, God, I want, to, I want to grow in my faith. God, I want to do right. I want to obey you. I want to be a help to my brothers and sisters in Christ. But these things are struggling with me. And nurture that fellowship with God and, and nurture your prayer to God. I think two things can happen. One is we get beat up quite a bit. You know what I mean by getting beat up in spiritual battles? You ever get knocked down on your knees and bloody your knees? Do you ever have a bad day? Do you ever ever come to the end of the day and say, I wish I could relive today? I would have done that differently. I would have talked about that, whatever, differently. But there's something else. I think by God's grace... We may fall down, but by God's grace, we won't stay down. You get up. How many times shall I get up? Seventy times seven. You keep getting up. You don't stay down. You don't use your struggles as an excuse. You get up. You get knocked down, you get up again. You get knocked down, you get up again. Because you're on your way to the celestial city. And it's just down the road and it won't be long. The good fight means you don't quit. Are you listening to me? The things that impress me most about people is not that they fail, but they refuse to accept failure as a permanent state of existence. I keep getting up. Be intentional. Focus your will. Give an earnest effort. Manage your emotions. Soak your mind in biblical truth. Soak your heart in the promise of God. Feed your faith the truth that God gives in the word. Harness your fear and negative emotion. Nurture your fellowship with God and your prayer to God. <clears throat> and hear the testimony of a man who walked through many valleys and came to the end. He said the following. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who has loved his appearing. May the Lord grant that you and I will come to the end of our journey and say something similar to that. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. But that's earned. I <laughs> remember. I remember one particular night I was teaching in school. It was a grad class, and these were some older students, and usually older students are better students. But I came to find out that these three students in the class had gotten together, and they had decided to interrupt my class by complaining how much homework I was assigning to them. And one stood up and said, uh, I don't like the homework. And those said, I agree with you, stood up. And then the third one, I said, wait, stop. Sit down. I have something to say. And this is what I said. Some time from now, you're going to walk across the stage of this school. And they will say to you, we're going to give you a diploma. I'm telling you tonight, we don't give you anything. You earn it. And that begins with my assignments in this class. It was quiet. You want to come to the end to say, I fought a good fight? You earn it. You earn it by how you fight tonight and tomorrow and every day you live. May God give you grace and strength to fight well. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. That you didn't deliver us from the fight. But you deliver us through the fight. Even though we have to fight. And sometimes it's not just. It is defending the faith. When it's attacked by the people. Sometimes. Sometimes it's fighting the battles within ourselves. When we want to quit. We want to give in. We want to give out. As you told young Timothy through this word and admonition from Paul to fight the good fight of faith, take hold of eternal life to which he was called. I pray that we hear that same message to not cave, to not accommodate, to not compromise, but to fight the good fight of faith, to take hold of that for which you have taken hold of us. Strengthen our resolve. Give us a stubborn obedience to Christ. For your glory and for your honor. Use us. That we may bear fruit for your kingdom. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Oh, we're not done yet, Joel.